Hello and welcome to the Swim Reef this week. I am joined by Eric Wyken. Um, Eric, are you at home? You're not at a swim meet this weekend. You're you're preparing yeah, for yeah, the holidays. That's right. that's right. I am I am back home um, after a week of ju juniors and then a quick jump out to a uh, collegiate team to do a fitting. Um, back home, back here in my apartment for three days, and then I'm going to be gone for 17 days um, working remote from home in Wisconsin and there Nebraska. Go. There you go. I mean, why anyone would voluntarily agree to spend time in the state of Wisconsin is beyond me, but bucks and six to each their own, I guess. Um, our other uh, Wisconsin native Joel Rawlings could not be here this week. He's actually uh, working with researchers from the University of Oregon to develop a new standard for ethically sourced quinoa to put in granola. So he's gonna be a little bit busy with that for some time um, and obviously very important work that he's doing. So we don't wanna disturb him while we're recording this, right? Well, let's talk about some swimming. Um, we got uh, juniors uh, was completed last, last weekend. We have short course worlds going on right now. We have random Lithuanian swim meets where um, a name you might re remember from Lithuania has put up some impressive times. We have people talking about where they're gonna train. All, all of our favorite hobby horses are here for this week. Uh, let's lead off um, with juniors last weekend. Uh, you were out at the West meet in Austin, Texas. Incidentally, the West meet in Austin, Texas, but whatever. Um, <laughs> It is the wild west down there in Texas. Is, it, is that the west? Is that even like is that even in the western half of Texas? No. No, actually, it's no. Yeah, it's it's kind of central. Yeah, <laughs> it's mostly east. But. Okay. I bet I bet I don't know. I would like to see the midline of the United States and see what side of uh, of it Austin, Texas, is on. But regardless, a great place to hold the swim meet. Talk a little bit about what you saw out in Austin. Um, it was an a huge meet. I haven't been to that big of a meet since before the whole world shut down. So yeah. it was certainly a, a bit of adjustment. Uh, it was it was fun to see everybody be there because it seemed like it was it really was two years in the making in terms of what was going down at that meet. Um, just the depth, the pure depth of that meet. If anything, it's never been like that. Um, and obviously it's been a couple of years since then and kids have really advanced over the last two years. So uh, just remember speaking to a couple of coaches about kids who have really good swims. Like for example, it was the two IM, two different coaches or like their kids went 150 point in the two IM. And I don't think either of them cracked the top 50. Mm. So uh, just, just one example of of the depth of that meet and then some of the times that are being put up are just i mean are inch, <laughs> closer and closer to finaling at, at uh ncaa's with some of these swims and then i had my first full experience with sandpiper and their their national team and it was incredible absolutely incredible yeah one of my one of my co i'm borrowing this from one of my co-workers but he basically said sandpiper is now a pro team for high school kids you know, in terms of like <laughs> how how good they are and how many star yeah. uh, swimmers they have in one place, and and it looks good. I mean, the it really did pass the eye test. Watching that five hundred heat was like nothing I've ever seen at an eighteen and under meet. When you have when you have a, when you have a young lady going four thirty eight and getting third, you know, it's just because she's behind two teammates going four thirty two. It, it's just, it's, it was really kind of inspiring. So that everybody was watching. There wasn't one person who really wasn't watching unless they were just warming down or warming up from another race. Everybody's eyes were on that heat. And, and like I said, they look good. I mean, everything is connected. Well, the, sh the shoulders look super healthy in the way that they're moving. This isn't kids who are, who've been scrambling and just surviving the work that they are doing. They're thriving. And it's really, it's really nice to see. I know, and I've been the, the anti distance guy on this podcast, so to speak, whether it was intentional or unintentional, but 
you know, I got to say when it, when it looks like that and the kids are put together and there's a lot of thought behind it, you, you get those results and it's, it's fantastic to see. So, um, yeah, I, it's working. I, I do think Eric and maybe my, my perspective has been changed by where I work now, but I do think maybe at least in comparison to however I thought high volume training was supposed to look before I was involved with it. It does seem to be quite a bit more refined and I can't tell whether it's always been that way and I just didn't understand or it's probably a little bit of both, you know, that also um, there's just nobody mindlessly, not, not nobody, but nobody really prominent, like mindlessly torturing kids yeah, to make them better at swimming. <laughs> so yeah, it's certainly not. They looked, yeah. I mean, they looked great. Their stroke count, their stroke rate, everything was just, it was, you could tell they're putting in all that detail work mm -hmm. in order to be at that level. Cause it really doesn't make any sense to do that kind of volume edit and not be thoughtful. So yep. kudos yep. to Sam Pipers for their unofficial protein <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think um the east meet was exciting as well uh you know this podcast is sponsored by jersey wahoos so you're all gonna have to deal with a, a short jersey wahoos update we sent five swimmers to the meet they all scored um some highlights henry mcfadden a junior boy um he finaled a finaled in all three events that he swam 500 200 freestyle and 200 butterfly um we had a girl junior uh, who's committed to the University of Wisconsin, um, <laughs> Maddie Wagner. Uh, she, a final in the 500 free, she got second in the 1650, 1608, which is, um, I think, a pretty impressive time. Although, you know, you have to put it up against uh, what you guys saw out west, you know? Yeah, well, that's not really, yeah, it's not really fair. <laughs> but it's, it's still pretty, it, it's still pretty darn fast. Um, and, uh, you know, I think probably the biggest story of the East meet was Thomas Heilman, who seemed to seem to have been at a swim meet for like two weeks straight. I don't, yeah. I'm trying to figure out exactly what happened here, but he must be turning 15 very soon and was just primed and ready to go. And so he just spent two weeks just, uh, tearing the, um, national age group records in 13, 14 to shreds. Um, some of them extremely impressive in my book, national age group records, like, um, really, really high level swims. Some that I thought would probably stay for a lot longer than they would. And he, he crushed them. I mean, for example, um, Michael Andrews, hundred fly at a, a 46 at age 14, I, I don't know. I guess I thought that was pretty safe, but apparently Thomas Heilman goes 45 in the hundred butterfly. He's yeah. 14 years old. Um, I can't even this one, like I'm, I'm not even joking. I cannot even discuss it. I cannot, I cannot fathom what is going on. I cannot put any context about it. I'm literally at a loss for words as to like uh, what is going on. And not only because it's so impressive for a 14 year old, but also because he's a 14 year old and I really have no idea where this is going to go from here. So um, that's sort of all I'll say about the Heilman yeah. stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, wow. Um, all right. Let's move on to short course worlds um, meet. That is you know, this post-Olympic short course worlds is probably one of the least hyped um, international meets on the Olympic quads. It is. I mean, yeah. Olympic quad yeah. calendar. It's just sort of like, okay, all right, we're going to have another big meet again six months after the Olympics. And um, there's always some people missing, um, but obviously still some amazing things that are happening. We saw um, Shuan Hai. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right. <laughs> this is, this is an yeah. Irish, it's an Irish name, so I'm going to get in extra trouble. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Siobhan, um, break world record in the, uh, 200 freestyle. Um, and you had some stuff, you had something to say basically about how she swam the race. We're not going to watch it here. Yeah. You know, save no, that for my it, own videos, solo <laughs> videos where I cut you and Joel out. 
yeah yeah no it's par for the course right right no i mean it was just it just looked like she could have gone forever i mean she was just i don't know it's really kind of one of those another one of those swims like we just saw it you know i tried to equate it to like what was going on at at west juniors when somebody is just firing at all cylinders she's just really well connected with the water just consistent stroke just accelerating into that that the finish itself there was there was no signs of fatigue at all which is going to be interesting to see here um, as the meet progresses but no i was i was really impressed with with the the strength of which she was swimming that race i had never really seen a lot of her races let alone a camera being able to focus on her for 200 meters like that um but i was impressed nonetheless yeah um, and if we move to day two, uh, Sweden set a world record in the women's four by 50 medley. Sarah Schustrom split 23.9 for Butterfly. <laughs> and because Federica Pellegrini has retired, she is my new favorite um, swimmer that I just like, I don't know. I just always find myself cheering for Sarah Schustrom, um, even though she's so good and wins so much. You know, she, somehow she cannot um she cannot become that sort of overwhelming favorite where i get annoyed that she's winning all the time i just she's I just a, love it she seems like a great person she seems yeah, like, she seems like she's having love to be able to a, coach yeah she seems like she's having a great time um every if you time you focused I, on 50s too you, you'd probably be happy <laughs> yeah yeah just you know just breaks her elbow and keeps on chugging um we had the men's hunter backstroke where why don't you say who won the men's hunter backstroke? And oh, you mean little... your boy Shane Casas, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your your adopted son, Shane Casas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's good to see him back in the water. It's good to see him kind of get things straightened out a bit compared to what happened this summer with the Austin and not and then Austin and not again and back in AM and just kind of been totally under the radar, it seems, this fall. I haven't really seen anything out of him there. I mean, in terms of, of, of beats other than he did the, the time trial, which he's always been a great short course swimmer. So seeing him time trial essentially um, at home was, was fine. But then to see him actually in competition with other people with something on the line, yeah. it was good to see him come out on top because that didn't happen in Omaha. You know, it was, maybe that's what it, maybe he needed Omaha to happen in order to be able to make, you know, short course worlds happen the way that it did granted he's a full second behind the world record who Roll holder wasn't allowed to travel because of whatever rules usa <laughs> swimming uses to pick their team i bet coleman stewart's uh, not salty at all watching these guys go 49 2 and win the world title i'm sure he's just like oh that's totally fair good for yeah. him <laughs> unbelievable i mean i would be if i was him i would be so mad looking at these results as mad as i was to not make it i would be yeah. once again very yeah mad. and then and to have the other guy in the hunter back dip out um and not swim at all so oh. you know it's like to add insult to injury they could have gone one two i mean yeah yeah it's easily and whether or not he would have matched his world record he certainly could have been 48 high and would have walked out of there with a gold medal and a lot of money that a lot of money he's now not getting because yeah. of this selection process or whatever it's called yeah yeah well um a sideshow that we referenced earlier to this meet um going on is uh at the lithuanian short course championships which as you know are always held the weekend before christmas you knew that right you're a big um, Lithuanian swimming fan. <laughs> they, no, they, I, I don't actually know. <laughs> this could be a COVID thing where they're like, well, we usually actually <laughs> hold it. You know, I don't know. But anyway, they're holding them. And uh, Ruta Militai yes. was, was back and swimming. Yes. Um, unofficially, it's not really a coming out of retirement. She's right. contemplating whether or not to come back. And, and go full force it, it it doesn't seem that she necessarily needs to but she's going to focus on the 50 and the 100 she could probably get away with um 
maybe training a little less. Somebody tried to Google translate um, an article from Lithuania that she's training up to four times a week and going times fast enough to win short course in the 50 short course world of 50 breast and then yeah. a, a, a very serviceable 105 when you know the hundred's going to take a while to get that back end to be where it is but it looks like it looked like Ruta it looked like the breaststroke that I remember it certainly looked she's still athletic because she came off that block like a rocket like she's always done and I had forgotten what it's like to see somebody come off the blocks like that especially on the women's side, there's not, it doesn't seem to be a lot of power like that coming off the blocks. And it's, yeah, it's exciting because I, I would love to see her come back. She's 24, you know, she had all that success years ago. So it's not like she's, you know, 34 or anything like that. Um, not that she couldn't do it at 34, I should say, rather. Uh, but no, it's good to see somebody who fallen out of love with the sport come back in some way, you know, and not in, I hope it works out for her. I mean, obviously anybody would probably say the same, maybe except for Joel probably would be the naysayer here. Um. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I love it too. I think, you know, one of the things that's really challenging about women's swimming is that you can be, especially in breaststroke, apparently you can be world elite at quite a young age. So you can be sort of, you can be the best breaststroker in the world at age 15. Are you, um, ready to produce a very fast time in the 100 breast or the 50 breast or the 200 breast or whatever? Absolutely. Oftentimes, um, are you psychologically prepared for that level of success? I don't know how you could be, honestly. So, um, you know, I, I've seen it, we've seen it many, many times over the history of the sport of swimming where, you know, at being so good at the age of 15 can sort of end up being a bit of a curse long-term. Um, and rarely, if ever, I'm having trouble coming up with a really notable, I guess like maybe Dana Vollmer or something, you know, would be an example of somebody who is really good around that age and sort of like, I don't know that she ever fully retired, but she sort of receded and came back. Um, you know, so I love to see this as many times over. If we can chart a path for super successful 15 year olds to be able to deal, reckon with that and reckon with the part where um, things don't work quite as they did, you know, when you were just a rocket ship headed towards the moon there at age 15 and sort of come back around on it. I think that would be great. And so of yeah, course it, I'm it, cheering for it. Yeah. It's, I don't know if it's, unfortunately don't know if it's even just this beat, whether or not she fully comes back is, is going to get the traction that it needs to really kind of have that impact because there there are kids who even not even so much at this level but they get no. to college and it's just not going well but they need they need to see this kind of story that if there if there's a need for a hard reset which clearly clearly she needed to to step away um given the life that exploded in front of her after she won that gold medal like just right her whole world completely changed but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful. And it also just based on how, how we're seeing things with athletes being professional and then just extending their careers, um, you know, we need to see more and more stories of, of, of people like her or, you know, anybody in general just coming back and, and continue to do it. And very fortunate for her that she's in a stroke, you know, the 50, a stroke and breaststroke in the 50 and the 100, where the kind of training that she would need to do to be an elite level isn't, you know, 30 hours a week, you know, no. because you, because as, as you know, you can't, you can't train breaststroke like that. Um, yeah. I mean, you, maybe some of well, the Eastern uh, countries. But. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dan, somewhere <laughs> Daniel Gerta is, uh, is maybe listening to this and he's going, what the heck? <laughs> Why was I doing 4,200s again? You're telling me I didn't need to? No. I think he's probably pretty proud of himself for the kinds I'm, of steps I'm, that he I'm completed. sure he is. He's had a lot of success and he's swaying <laughs> breaststroke. He could do that frog stroke way better than I ever could. Yeah, um, seriously. But yeah, 29-3 in that 50. It Amazing. Putting up a time that is really competitive after just being completely out of touch for, for years is great. And amazing. And and you as you say, like power 
really like power and strength was her game. Even at age 15, she was incredibly powerful and incredibly strong. And there's no reason why she couldn't be, even, even with um, less time in the pool, she could definitely be stronger at age 24. That's, that's sort of like basic um, maturation, <laughs> human yeah. maturation. She should be able to be stronger. So um, certainly not out of the question. And uh, I think however she wants to re-engage in the sport, if she wants to re-engage even beyond, you know, swimming at the Lithuanian short course championships, I think break some, awesome. break some, some world, there are masters world records. Yeah. I mean, look, I, you know, per, this stuff's a little personal for me too, because I, um, all my personal best in swimming were from when I was 26 and 27 years old, you know, when I was just sort of like, I, I had started coaching and, but I'd swim a little bit on my own and I was trying to fool around with stuff and just have fun and continue to compete and race and, do all that um, jazz. And I thought that was incredibly rewarding. I think a lot of people would, would find a similarly rewarding experience from doing something like that. And yes, you're right. It's, it's, it's whatever level you're at um, being able to sort of reapproach it on your own terms, I think um, has a ton of value. You got anything else on um, your miracle agenda that we came up with five minutes before we started recording? <laughs> I, now uh, I'm, yeah. I'm running out of gas. Um, no, the, and, yeah, the only thing that, that comes to mind is we saw that, uh, I think I shared with both of you guys, that the pick of uh, Coley has, has been in, um, forget, Coley Stickles. Flagstaff. Yeah, Coley, was, Coley Stickles has been Flagstaff. He you can't just in. call him Coley like he's everybody's best friend on the podcast. Sorry. Like, oh, we're just talking about Coley. You know your yeah. guy. There, there's a there's really only one in swimming. <laughs> That's um, true. So, but he was he's actually out at Short Course Worlds. Um, he's been writing workouts um, for I can't I don't know how to say her name correctly. A young lady from France, Pearl. Um, Pearl Gasoldello. Yeah, yeah, that one. Um, and then is it Diaceto? Is yeah is touring the united states and he landed in flagstaff with coach stickles and now they're all out at short course worlds and who else is going where <laughs> who's where's where's seto gonna go next you know what's he what's he what's he gets out of short course or if he's already in he's already in the middle east does he just kind of bounce over to to europe does he stay out that way um do whatever he wants now uh, right so I just, it's just, it'll be interesting to see where it comes, uh, you know, sorry, where, where things go with some of the other pros and if they're going to do the same kind of bounce around thing again, you know, um, we're now, it would have been nice to see uh, Ledecky go to short course worlds. I don't know. Yeah. We could have gotten She's, another look at her turns, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, her, her 200 turns are definitely better. She's just holding it for a 400 or 800. Not oh, quite so you think I was sharp. unfair because I looked at the 400. Was that the mistake I made? I don't know if it was unfair. Um, I just like with any changes, you know, it's like, like the longer the race, the, yeah. it's going to take a while for them to get there. It's, it's unless you've been watching her turns intently, you know, for a long time, like even whatever, I'm assuming her coaches would see this, you know, it's these, these little micro adjustments that are leading towards a better place. I mean, she still has that little bit of, of keeping the head up and inching yeah. forward, but it's not. Well, like a, what like a load like, up, like head, but yeah. yeah what kind of looked like it was, you know, she was going to drop her forehead on the edge of the pool. Um, but I'm trying to think. Well, I'm, I, look, I'm happy pool. because if she keeps changing it, you know, I can always make an update second. Is Katie yeah. Ledecky really fixing her turns part two <laughs> video? <laughs> yeah. I haven't checked to see how the one is doing from yesterday, but uh, I'm assuming, you know, with the name that I put in it, it's going to probably do pretty well. It might, yeah, it might, it might grab the algorithm go yeah. for a ride. We'll see. Um, but I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see what, yeah, what everything, how everything surfaces coming off of now fully coming off of the ISL and getting out of that, a lot of those pros now kind of heading home. Um, PD's nowhere to be found at that meet. Obviously, he's been dancing away the fall. and um, 
I'm waiting for the next, I'm waiting for the next article on who's going to be training somewhere else. And yeah, take- but you know, you, but they got to figure this stuff out fairly soon. The, one of the things I think is going to be really interesting is how short this Olympic cycle is. You know, I'm already hearing about yeah. the opening ceremonies um, in Paris where instead of being three and a half years away, we're two and a half years away. And, yeah. you know, how long do you want to be in a place? I mean, obviously, if you feel good about the place you're in, you want to be there as long as possible. Um, but, you know, it's the, the closer you get, the more risk there is with sort of bouncing around. And I don't think that they actually, these Olympic caliber athletes, they don't have that much more time yeah. sort of play around with where they're going to train is there but is could you say is there maybe a correlation between the amount of time they have relative to the distance of the race is somebody like i mean i'm, I'm being got a honest, lot of like, theories based on how long people's races are i'm not sure i am we'll, i'm we'll on think, board I with mean, any of them well think about a 50 or 100 like you need a solid training block, but you could, I mean, Lizak trained himself. He was on his own. So it's not like you definitely well, I think that says need... more about people's ability to coach the 50 and 100 free than Lizak. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just now I'm being the cynic I, again. I, I've, I've always had issue with, even now that people are swimming fast all the time, it's, it's, there's always been the issue with like, you know, taper twice in one season. You know, it's, you can't taper in December and taper for March. Like there's, there was so much of that. And now it's like, it's seemingly everybody is swimming fast all the time. The NCAAs, you can't get away with swimming slow at a dual meet, or you're just not going to travel. So that, that, that's all there. I think we just, um, yeah, I have a lot of theories. I think people put too much stock into certain things, but I also think that there's, there's a lot when it comes to resiliency and an athlete to just kind of respond and do whatever based on, I think it's easier for somebody who's in shorter races than somebody that maybe needs that long consistent block for, you know, 1500 and the 1500, 800 double or something like that. It's, I, I don't know. It just seems like there's, you could do way more with different coaches and have who have different, who have different, focuses or are better at specific things like somebody like Coley Stickles versus <clears throat> excuse me a sprint coach like DeSorbo or you know what you're getting at NC State or what you're getting at Texas it's yeah you know. I mean I guess I I have another different theory and it sort of dovetails with your theory so I'll see if I can't you know close the loop on it but I think it has more to do just in general with like the the maturity level of the athlete, how good have they gotten at absorbing all sorts of different inputs? And I think maybe sprinting tends to self-select a little bit more just because in general, you're going to have right now you have older athletes. So they've been around for longer. They've had more time to mature, I would say. And they probably have had more situations where they've had to go like, I just have to figure out how this works for me. This is not ideal for me, but I'll make it work. And, um, you know, then you end up with a lot of people who at the end who can go to various places and go like, ah, here's what they do here. Here's what works for me. Here's what doesn't. And I'll make the best out of this situation and I'll get something out of being here. Um, and I think certainly we're going to see some of that. And, um, as we go here. Yeah. I'm not saying club hopping two two months from, from trials is going to work, but work, work for Margaret Holzer in 2008. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a reference that everybody's yeah. like, everybody listening to works this for, is like, okay, Chris, what? Yeah. Works, works for Carolyn Joyce. <laughs> Did it? Yeah. Well, the year that she bounced over to swim Mac and ended up making the team. So that was yeah. her, that was after her time with Colorado stars. Okay. All right. Um, well, guys, uh, I think that we're going to end it there. Eric, thanks for joining me. Thanks for drinking Firestone uh, beer. It's, I also think it's excellent. <laughs> Free plug for them. And um, <laughs> thank you. It was club soda. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. One o'clock in the afternoon. That's right. Yeah, you got work to do, man. Yeah, you can't be, you can't be drinking a night in, in the middle of the day. Eric. Um, all right, everybody. 
everybody could see it was clear. You're good. I think you're fine. Um, uh, wish Joel luck on his um, quinoa research and uh, we'll see you next week.